This evening, we are, we are indeed privileged to have with us Father Daniel Callum, who is a member of the Bazillion Order. And he will be addressing us this evening, as we know, on one aspect of the sacrament of baptism. Father Callum serves as an associate professor here in the theology department. Uh, likewise, he is the uh, university campus, campus chaplain and certainly a popular lecturer here on campus and uh, certainly off campus. Father Callum holds degrees from the University of St. Michael's College, Wayne State University, and Oxford U University. Many of us probably uh, know Father Callum in reference to a number of popular topics he has addressed in recent years. But tonight he is going to uh, look at a topic that many of us have heard of for probably since our childhood. But as we approach it this evening, uh, it will be with a kind of renewed vigor. And that topic we look at in reference to the gifts of the Spirit within the sacrament of baptism. So let us give Father Callum a warm welcome this evening. Thank you, Sister. Uh, we are baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The creed, originally an expansion of the baptismal ceremony, guides our understanding of the significance of what we have received. The creed is divided, therefore, into three sections, re referring um, by appropriation to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, refers to our understanding of Cre creation. I believe in his only Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ, who died, was buried, rose on the third day, reminds us of the truth of our, of our redemption. In the final section, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, refers to sanctification. We are sanctified by the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, which are found described in Isaiah chapter 11, as the gift that will descend upon the Messiah when he comes. Since the Messiah has come, and since by our sacramental life we are joined to him, we too can share in those seven gifts, wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, fear of the Lord. Let me call your attention, first of all, to the fact that the Bible likes lists of things. We have the seven days of creation, for example, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Plagues of Egypt. And those who know their Bible thoroughly will realize that there are many genealogies one after the other, endless names, mysterious to most of us. That biblical characteristic is also found in the New Testament. The genealogies of Jesus continue the, that interest in descent that was so characteristic of the Old Testament, for example. Also, St. Paul likes lists. Galatians chapter 5 contrasts evil with good by an accumulation of evil, 15 of them, and a description of what the Spirit can do, the fruits of the Spirit, nine of them. Here's what he says, Galatians chapter 5. Now the works of the flesh are plain, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness, dissension, party spirit, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Then he goes on to say, the fruit of the Spirit is joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these there is no law. One obvious reason for this list is the power, the power of accumulation. The sheer weight of that list of sins, of evils, reminds us that every one, any one of them is enough to, to sink the soul. The burden of all of them is overwhelming. And it prepares, it prepares us, too, for the joy of recognizing in the gifts of the Spirit the same effect working the other way. Love, joy, peace, patience, and so on, these are all wonderful things. And when we see them gathering together in, in, the, in the heart of those who are driven, directed by the Spirit, we realize how beautiful they are. It's not surprising, therefore, that we have many lists in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 13, we have a famous list, faith, hope, and charity, these three. 
and the greatest of these is charity. Or the seven churches of the book of Revelation, or the seven petitions of the Lord's Prayer, or the eight Beatitudes, and so on. I might note that this literary device, if I can call it that, this literary device <clears throat> is found elsewhere. I ran across a reference to Gandhi, and he has the seven sins of the modern world. Um, it has nothing at all to do with my talk, but it might be interesting to see his list. Wealth without work, pleasure without passion, knowledge without character, commerce without morality, science without humanity, worship without sacrifice, politics without principle. A very good list. Mother Teresa has one too. Hers, she has five. The fruit of silence is prayer. The fruit of prayer is faith. The fruit of, the fruit of faith is love. The fruit of love is service. The fruit of service is peace. Now, what's nice about Mother Teresa is that there's a link between all of them. It's not simply a collection, helter-skelter, in any which way. Silence leads to prayer, which leads to faith, which leads to love, which leads to service, which leads to peace. There's a, a pattern of development that is worth looking at. My question for you tonight, therefore, is, first of all, why have lists at all? What do they... What do they add? And secondly, is there any significance to the actual ordering of the lists? I call your attention, therefore, to this literary device, as I call it, which is biblical. It could be called repetitive variation. The lists are all concerned with the same thing, vice or virtue, for example. But they, they play upon it. They give us different aspects. They look at it from one point of view or another. In the book of Psalms, we find something similar, where an idea will be, will be presented over and over again with different words to express the same, the same basic idea. For example, Psalm 119, the longest in the entire Psalter, 176 verses. Each one is saying more or less the same thing, a reflection on the law which God had given to his people. Uh, I'll illustrate it with a few verses. I'm quoting then from Psalm 119. Thy commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for, my, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep thy precepts. See, it's basically the same idea, isn't it? But it's expressed in slightly different words, different aspects of it. It goes on that way for 176 verses. And anyone who's attended a Catholic wedding will be familiar with another one from St. Paul. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. Love is not puffed up. We're very familiar with that. What's the point of it? The point, of course, is that a great idea cannot be expressed in a single concept. If I'm, if I'm truly to understand what it means to love, for example, I need all the help I can get. Because it's so manifold in its manifestations that no one concept or even a, a list of concepts is sufficient for it. And similarly, with the gifts of the Holy Spirit or the effect of vice or the Beatitudes or the days of creation or the Lord's Prayer. It's a basic idea which is looked at from every angle because anything worth looking at is worth examining. So yes, there, this notion of repetitive variation, this, list, uh, this listing intensifies the concept that the sacred author is trying to put across. And I would go even further, and following the lead of Mother Teresa, I would say that there is a significance to the very order of these terms. And my authority is not only Mother Teresa, I can also call upon St. Jerome. He was famous for his translations. He knew Hebrew, he knew Greek, and he translated both of them into Latin. And he said, normally, when I translate, I go for sense. I read the passage, I know what it means to say, and then I put it into Latin. It may be Greek, it may be Hebrew. But he said, there is one exception. When I come to the words of sacred scripture, I translate much more literally, because in the Bible, even the order of the words is significant. And that's what I would like to suggest to you tonight, that the ordering of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit is to be reflected upon as well as their content. Now we see wisdom at the top of the list. 
Wisdom is the ultimate goal. To understand the progression, however, we must start at the bottom, fear of the Lord. I have very good evidence for the fact that the beginning is fear of the Lord. The Bible tells me so. Psalm 111, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who practice it. The fear of the Lord is the notion of reverence for God. Psalm 34, O fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no want. And there are many, many other biblical texts that indicate that the fear, a holy dread, a consciousness that in encountering God we are out of our depth, a bit like those primitive cartoons I used to watch when I was a boy, where the, the animal fleeing would run off the, the side of a cliff without falling until it got about 10 feet out, looked down and realized there's nothing under it, and then bang, down it went. Well, the fear of the Lord is that recognition that we're walking on air, and there's nothing to hold us up. We're out of our depth. The notion of reverence is extremely important if we are to be, succeed in approaching God. Newman, in one of his sermons, describes very well the casual attitude that keeps some people back from recognizing God in their lives. It's rather long, but Newman writes so beautifully, and I like to read it that I shall in, indulge myself and perhaps you. Here's what he said. Is this not the common error, the fatal error of the world, to think itself a judge of religious truth without preparation of heart? Then he quotes the Bible. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and mine know me. Or again, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Again, the pure in heart shall see God. To the meek, mysteries are revealed. He that is spiritual judgeth all things. The darkness comprehended it not. That list of biblical quotations reminds us, therefore, to approach God, we must approach metaphorically or even physically on our knees. Newman says it well. Gross eyes see not. Heavy ears hear not. But in the school of the world, the ways towards truth are considered, are considered high roads open to all men, however disposed, and at all times. Truth is to be approached without homage. Everyone is considered on a level with his neighbor, or rather the powers of the intellect, acuteness, sagacity, subtlety, and depth are sought the guides into truth. Men consider that they have as full a right to discuss religious subjects as if they themselves were religious. They will enter upon the most sacred points of faith at the moment, at their pleasure, if it so happen, in a careless frame of mind, in their hours of recreation, over the wine cup. Is it wonderful that they so frequently end in becoming indifferent and conclude that religious truth is but a name, that all men are right and all wrong? From witnessing externally the multitude of sects and parties, and from the clear consciousness they possess within, that their own inquiries end in darkness. The beginning, therefore, is the fear of the Lord, this reverence. That's the fundamental step. When that is in place, when a person realizes the privilege he has to come in contact with the living God, to hear the voice of Jesus Christ and be guided by the Spirit, this reverence moves to piety. Literally, piety is respect for the ordering of society. I have piety, for example, when I respect my elders, when I give honor to my parents, when I teach my teachers or professors with the honor that they deserve because of their wisdom and care for their students and things like that. Piety, therefore, is a right ordering of society. In other words, if I fear the Lord and recognize my position before him, I am able then to see his representatives in the secular, in the religious, in the intellectual, in the emotional order. Piety allows me to enter into the proper relationship with those around me. So moving from fear to piety, I then come to knowledge. Because seeing things as they are is the only true knowledge. I must know reality. I don't want to live in a dream world. I want to see things and honor things in their full reality. To take a, a, an example, the difference between strip mining and, and farming. The small family farm, ideally at least, 
honors and preserves the soil. Strip mining tears it open and leaves it uh, infertile. In China, I'm told, people, a farm has been used for a thousand years and more. That is, that is understanding, that is knowledge based on piety, a sort of reverence, one could say, that comes from fear. When one, therefore, has such knowledge, one realizes that fortitude is required, the next link in our chain. There are difficulties to be overcome. Come. It's not always easy to stand up for the truth, to do what is right. Our society, our position in society, our contacts and so on, sometimes require almost heroism if we are to do the right thing. So knowing is not enough. I must have the strength to, to stand up, to be counted, to do what is right. Counsel, therefore, comes in because I soon discover that so the difficulties that I face are beyond my own ability, first of all, to come and to understand, to know, and then secondly, to, to counter. So although I may have the, the, the greatest strength and courage, unless I have the advice of others wiser than I am, I will flounder. Uh, that leads us, therefore, ultimately to understanding, which is related to knowledge as the sea is related to a lake. In other words, as the general is related to the specific. Understanding is able to take the details of knowledge, the facts, the insights that I have, and put them into something like a coherent whole. It's a worldview and a defensible, a good worldview that allows me to speak, understand, act. All the other virtues, therefore, fear, piety, knowledge, fortitude, counsel, come into play with my understanding. I'm at last able to, to function in a way I should. And the ultimate gift, therefore, is going to be wisdom, which goes beyond understanding because it is the ability to see things as God sees them. Understanding is the acme of human achievement. Wisdom takes me beyond that, and it certainly is the gift of the Spirit, the climax. This is the, this is the possession of the, of the Messiah. This is the possession of the true Israel, the new David, the one who can share these gifts with his followers as he does in baptism. I noticed that in the Bible, Christ is called the new David, Christ, son of David. I noticed in the Bible, too, in the Old Testament, that we're told there will be a new David who will come. God loved David, and therefore the Messiah is called the son of David, also called his Lord, as we know. But the Messiah is never called the son of Solomon. He's not called the new Solomon. And wondering about that, because Solomon, in Jewish, and, and therefore in, in Christian understanding, is the great wise man, I looked at Solomon's prayer from the book of Kings, and I was surprised, almost startled, to notice that Solomon did not ask for wisdom. He asked for understanding. He stopped one step short of the fullness that the Spirit brings. Here's his prayer from the book of Kings, 1 Kings chapter 3. O Lord, my God, you have made thy servant king in place of David, my father, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, whom thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered. Give thy servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern the people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this great people? Now Solomon's prayer was answered. He received understanding. He was a great monarch. Under his leadership, the kingdom extended far and wide. His wealth and his acuteness were celebrated throughout the world so that the queen of the south, the queen of Sheba, came to visit him and was astounded at his understanding. But we need something more than Solomon because we know that in his old age, Solomon with that huge harem he had, was misled by his theological wives to worship false gods. It tells us something about what, what the discussions, I guess, that went on in the harem. <laughs> Theology of all things. <laughs> <laughs> but we need someone greater than Solomon because our Lord says, the queen of the south will one will rise against this generation in judgment and she will condemn it. 
For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Solomon asked for understanding. It was a limited wisdom. It was the wisdom of the world. We need the wisdom that comes from the Holy Spirit. That is why St. Paul says, Jesus is the wisdom and the power of God. We preach Christ crucified, he said, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Christ the Messiah, therefore, is the ideal that gives us these gifts in their plenitude. He is the, our ideal by nature. He grew in wisdom, age, and grace before God and man, St. Luke tells us, but also by grace, because he is anointed with the Spirit at his baptism. That is the pattern we find repeated among the true followers of Christ. By nature, the apostles, for example, were educated by being with Christ, by seeing, hearing, touching, following, observing, but also by grace at Pentecost when the Spirit descended upon them and inflamed them with these gifts that we see displayed on the board. And, of course, the same is true of each of us. We have natural gifts. We have talents. We have a place. We have a history. We know things. We have these gifts, but they are surpassed and completed by baptism. So wisdom invites us to her feast. She has built her house and has set up her seven pillars she has slaughtered her beasts, she has mixed her wine, and yet she has also set her table. She sent out her maids to call from the highest places in the town, whoever is simple, let him enter here. To him is, is without sense, she says, come and eat of my bread and drink of the wine that I have mixed. Leave simple-mindedness and live and walk in the ways of insight. So those are the seven gifts to the Spirit. St. Augustine has a commentary on the Lord's Sermon on the Mount. And he does a, an exegetical tour de force. He takes the eight Beatitudes, which are part of our Lord's Sermon on the Mount, and he combines them with the seven petitions of the Lord's Prayer and the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Well, there's a certain mathematical problem there, isn't there? What are you going to do with eight Beatitudes and seven gifts of the Holy Spirit and seven petitions of the Lord's Prayer? But Augustine rises to the occasion. He said, really, there are only seven Beatitudes because the first and the last Beatitude have the same reward. The kingdom of heaven is theirs, and hence they are to be seen as equivalent. Hence, <laughs> seven Beatitudes, which fit very nicely with the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit and the, and the petitions of the Lord's Prayer. Now, when you look at St. Augustine's comments on that, they're not altogether that convincing, at least not to me. To understand it, you must, must, realize, you must realize that he knows that they're going to fit. He's not trying to discover it. He's trying to illustrate it. If there are seven petitions in the Lord's Prayer, seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, and seven beatitudes in this new numbering, they're going to fit together. So it's, it's not that he's trying to discover it, as I say. He wants us to, by reflecting on all three categories, to understand each one more deeply. For example, as you, as you see, the first one, the fear of the Lord is connected with the poor in spirit. And the first petition of the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name. Here's what he says. For if it is... The fear of the Lord, through which the poor in spirit are blessed, inasmuch as theirs is the kingdom of heaven, let us ask that the name of God be hallowed among, among men through that fear which is clean and enduring forever, quoting Psalm 19. Do you see what he's saying here then? The fear of God, the poor in spirit are those who have the true fear of God, and they are blessed for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And that God's name be, may be hallowed is the obvious sign that the kingdom of heaven has been established among men. Now, once again, he's not trying to prove anything. He knows that this is the case, and therefore he's willing to speak in this way. Similarly, piety. Piety, as I said, is a recognition of the, my relationship, my true relationship to those around me. And it especially concerns those uh, in authority over me. My parents, as I say, those who govern the, uh, the state, the church leaders, teachers, and so on. 
Now, meekness, of course, is a character of that person, not meek in the sense of groveling, but meek in the sense of willing to be led, to be docile, to be taught. So piety and meekness go together, and we are told that they will inherit the earth. Therefore, may thy kingdom come, because meekness, understanding things, being true, a well-ordered society is the way in which the earth and those in it will flourish. And he goes on in that way. Knowledge, for example, as you see, is associated with those who mourn and that his will may be done on heaven, uh, uh, rather in heaven, so on earth. Now, those who mourn are blessed by knowledge because, once again, they've had an experience that goes beyond the, the ordinary. They know things as they are. To mourn is to have loved, and to love is to know the person as I should know him, to appreciate him in his uniqueness. Only the person, therefore, who knows what human relationship is can possibly mourn. That's the knowledge that we're talking about. And the, the, the um, connection with that his will may be done as in heaven, so on earth, is the idea that God's providence must be recognized. And if his will requires me to suffer in this particular way, I must recognize that in the hand of God it is leading me to good. Then fortitude, well, that's an easier one. It's connected with those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And if that thirst is to be fulfilled, then we should be given the daily bread, which is both natural and supernatural. So fortitude is required for those who work for social justice, that the daily bread may be available widely. Um, St. Uh, St. Augustine uses the word prudence, where we would have counsel. Prudence or counsel, the merciful are blessed, they shall obtain mercy. In other words, we're related to other people. Counsel describes that relationship at its best, and we forgive their debts if we want to show mercy. Finally, or not quite finally, but understanding for the pure of heart, not to be led into temptation. I think that's quite obvious. And finally, wisdom. Peacemakers are blessed. They shall be called children of God. And when peace is there, we are truly free from evil. Now, that's a very sort of condensed description of what, uh, what Augustine accomplished. The point I'm trying to make, though, is that he could see several things here. The Bible is a single book. It has God as its author. One part illumines the other. If there are gifts of the Holy Spirit and Christ gives me the perfect prayer, then that prayer must be somehow connected to those gifts to the Spirit because I say the prayer directed by the Spirit himself. And the Beatitudes describe the perfection of the Christian life. The gifts of the Spirit and the Lord's Prayer must be related to it. He knows that before he starts. And hence he's able to, in this rather complicated uh, style of biblical interpretation, to not prove his point, but to convince us of his point. Uh, I want to explore this approach to the Bible in another way. When you start looking at the Bible with this notion of lists in mind, if they're popping up all over the place, and my theory, which I haven't, haven't demonstrated in detail to myself yet, but is that each one of those can be examined in this rigorous Augustinian way, that each list is not some accident, but carefully presented, so that if we look at it as we should, we can see a progression moving towards the steps of the spiritual life. I've taken this one from Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. I'll read you the full text. Finally, brethren, he says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Now let's try this approach on these gifts, the, these, these virtues. And once again, my idea, my idea is that these are carefully constructed, that there's a movement here. We start off with what is true. Once again, you see we're back into piety, into knowledge, into insight, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the same idea. Truth, of course, is concerned with the individual acting. Truth resides in the intellect, as faith does, the truths of faith. And therefore, the truth, knowing things as they are, like the fear of the Lord, is the beginning of the Christian life. It's based on what is real. Once that is in place, honor is available. In other words, when the person knows the truth, he has the invitation to act upon the truth, to be a good sort of person, to be honorable. That's in the will, concerned with morality. 
The person who bases his life, as I say, on what is true becomes honorable. And if he is honorable, then he moves from the individual to the social level. He is just, behaving honorably to others. The consequence, you see, of the first two is that he is able to treat the others as they deserve, knowing and loving what is true. The result of this, my, the fulfillment of my social obligations, acting as I should in society, brings me purity, a good conscience. The person who is honorable, in other words, to himself and to others, is pure, single-minded, is the biblical meaning of the word pure. Single-minded, undistracted, uncontaminated by unworthy, dishonorable desires or ambitions. With that in place, then, we can see that lovely, it's going to be lovely, social, such, pure, such purity is recognized and admired. Virtue is a good thing. It must appeal to anyone who has eyes to see. It's the undoing of the curse of Scripture against the hard-hearted. I'm quoting St. Mark here. He said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of heaven, but for those outside everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn again and be forgiven. A very strange statement. That our Lord spoke in parables in order that people would not understand, because he didn't want them to know the truth. The context means that they must be willing, they must desire, they must be willing to sacrifice for that truth. It's not available to the casual uh, observer, as Newman said, who may speak about religious topics and sacred things even over his wine cup. Once it's lovely, then we have grace or graciousness. This is to be skilled in goodness. This is the ability to do something in a pleasing manner, to be as graceful as Olympic, those Olympic athletes we saw on the ice last week. It points to the achievement of virtue, which is described by St. Thomas as a habit, a good habit. In other words, a way of life that has become so much part of me that I, I expertly, almost instinctively, act in the proper way. That is gracious. And finally, or not quite finally, second from the end, it leads me to the excellence, the highest moral achievement, success. The habitual practice of virtue brings with it perfection of the moral life that should characterize the Christians. Let me quote the catechism here. He who believes in Christ becomes the son of God. This filial adoption transforms him by giving him the ability to follow the example of Christ. It makes him capable of acting rightly and doing good. In union with his Savior, the disciple attains the perfection of charity, which is holiness. Having matured in grace, the moral life blossoms into eternal life, the glory of heaven. So the excellence, therefore, is this perfection which is available to us, not from our own powers, but under the power of the Spirit that comes to us in baptism. It's a noble and thrilling uh, adventure, the moral life. And at last, therefore, the last one, worthy. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. In contrast, let me follow St. Paul, who showed us evil in uh, juxtaposition to good, by giving you another parable from our Lord, illustrating the opposite movement, where each one of these virtues is countered by a vice. Here's the familiar parable. There was a householder who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to tenants and went to another country. When the season of fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Afterwards, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. When, therefore, the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those, those tenants? They answered him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let the vineyard out to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their season. Now, this is a parable for us. The other tenants are those who receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit and live according to this scheme of virtue that we find in all sorts of ways in the Bible. In the gifts of the Spirit that I began with, 
in the Philippians passage that we're, that we're looking at now, in the Lord's Prayer, in the Beatitudes, and so on. Think of those tenets, though. Instead of the truth, instead of being true, they are false. They refuse to recognize the fact that they have a duty to the owner of the vineyard. They don't own it themselves. Instead of being honorable, they are dishonorable in their selfishness. Instead of being just, the social uh, obligations, they are abusive and murderers. They destroy the society by their injustice. Instead of being pure, the individual conscience has been corrupted. And far from being lovely, their behavior, characterized by greed, rapacity, and violence, is ugly, morally repulsive. They are unskilled in goodness. They're skilled in vice with a crude and barbaric way of life. We can contract bad habits as well as good. And instead of excellence, we have all the actions of their life contaminated by this vicious practice. So the worth that they receive is the, the other side of the judgment. Depart from me, ye cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Looking, therefore, at the original text of Philippians chapter 4, we would do well in Lent to meditate upon those steps of virtue. And here's what St. Paul says, more or less telling us to do that. Keep on doing, he said, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Then the God of peace will be with you. And he puts it in the proper context for us who call ourselves Christians. If there's any encouragement in Christ, any incentive of love, in their participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. I hope you notice that list, incidentally. Any incentive of love, any participation in the spirit, any affection of sympathy, there are three that we could meditate upon in this way, seeing how each one is necessary for the Christian life. Let me conclude then by noting that the fundamental gift of the Holy Spirit is himself. Christ said, the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. St. Paul always picks up our Lord's words and expresses them for his people, this time to the Corinthians. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who, who dwells within you? which you have from God, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Hence, it's, we, we, we were not surprised when we come to St. Thomas Aquinas speaking about the new law. And he recognizes that the new law is the presence of the Holy Spirit in the believer. I'm, I'm quoting St. Thomas from the Summa Prima Secundae, 106, Article 1, if you want to look it up. The new law, he says, is the law of the New Testament. But the law of the New Testament is instilled in our hearts. And then he follows with a series of biblical quotations, concluding by quoting St. Augustine. As the law of deeds was written on tables of stone, so is the law of faith inscribed on the hearts of the faithful. And then finally Augustine says, what else are the divine laws written by God himself on our hearts but the very presence of of his Holy Spirit. Having the Spirit dwell within us means that we have a source of activity, a source of inspiration, an understanding of the world that comes from, from, uh, from without, from God himself. Now, God can be present to me in a way that does not destroy my identity because God is present to me as someone that I love and who is beloved of him. I was just mentioning this in class the other day. We were talking about uh, Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, who said that, that God's knowledge of my internal disposition is obscene. He said that I, I want some privacy. I want something to myself. I want to be my own man. I don't want someone watching everything I say and do. This intrusive presence, he said, is, is destroys me as a person. It takes away my independence. And the book we were reading countered him by saying, there is a situation where we want to open ourselves to the other person. 
where we want everything laid completely bare, where I, if I could, I would be the other person. And it's where there is love, where there is true friendship, uh, when, and that can take so many forms uh, in marriage, of course, but in any, in any friendship. I want to be that other person. I want to think with that other person. I want his thoughts to be my own. It's not obscene. It's the condition for leading a full human life. And what we cannot ever achieve by our own. I can never be the other person as much as I want to, as much as I love him. But God can do that. God can be present to me in a way that doesn't destroy, but enhances my identity. That is what we find in the ordering of our lives, in that progression towards wisdom that we find in Isaiah chapter 11 and in Galatians chapter 5. Oh, I forgot about Galatians chapter 5. <laughs> the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Yo, Blanche, when you see we have all these others to get through somehow. The fruits of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love, of course, like wisdom, is the climax. It's both the beginning and the end because it infuses every action of the Christian. Well, I think that I've spoken enough, I've made my point at least, in terms of method of reading Scripture, the openness and the subtlety that we should bring to the sacred text. So let me give you a program for your Lenten observance. Why not take these nine fruits of the Holy Spirit that we find in Galatians chapter 5 and meditate them on the way that I have indicated? I don't claim to practice it myself to any perfection any more than the Christian life. But a finger post is a signpost that has a finger at the end, and it points in the direction that you should go. And one definition of a finger post is the following, to which, with which I shall close by applying it to myself. The finger post, the signpost, can be called a parson, because like a finger post, he points out a way he probably will never go, the way to heaven. <laughs> Thank you.